Hello and welcome to Stash Chats. I'm Yvette and today I'm going to be joined by the wonderful Judy of Running So and So. So as always, if you've got any questions for Judy, drop them in the comments box and I'll weave those into our conversation. I'm really excited to talk to Judy today about her long career, in, well not career, but like her long sewing um, life and all the sewing that she's done over the decades. It's going to be really exciting and Judy's got loads of stuff to show us as well. So definitely join in with the comments. Let us know what you think of Judy's stash and maybe even some of the things that she's made. Um, it's going to be a really good fun episode. So yeah, let's get Judy on. Hello, Hello Judy. Hello there. Welcome to Stash Chat. Happy to be here. It's quite so, strange being here and not just talking to a dead camera. I know. It's quite strange on YouTube. It's really different. Um, so do you just want to kick us off by just talking about yourself, like what you sew like right now, a bit about your YouTube channel? So basically, I, I've only had this YouTube channel for just a few years, and it's not, very, it's not as big. It's not one of the huge, mega YouTube channels. Um, it's just really to record what I'm doing. So I have sewn, I'm 62. Um, I will be coming up to, oh God, I've, I've lost count, but I started sewing when I was four. Just after my fourth birthday, I did my very first piece of sewing, which was um, an old fashioned sampler. My mum got a piece of linen, she drew round a, a jar six times and I had to do embroidery stitches. And it was embroidery applique. And then when mum got the sewing machine, it was, I want one too no you're going on this propped up and off I went on a super fast Jones straight stitcher and I've not looked back so dolls clothes simple clothes I made my first shirt for myself when I was 10. Amazing so you basically learned to sew probably before you could read or write <laughs> similar age. I probably that's a good point actually Yvette I think if truth be told I can remember mum doing reading with us and sewing and I prefer the sewing to the reading I don't think if I'm being honest I don't think I read as quickly as some people do but I certainly sewed and funnily enough my son didn't read quickly but he's incredibly musical yeah quicker than he could read books I guess just different things just click for different people don't they different things yeah and you said now just rolling it forward I, I make I, I made this decision that I was going to have a me made wardrobe without realizing it was a big thing on social media um, before the sewing bee returned uh, be, became into it came into being in 2012. I decided I was going to make my have a, a me made wardrobe because I'd lost my husband by then and it was like my time and I was going to do this for me. Um, but my biggest problem is I want to quilt and I want to sew clothes and I want to run my dogs and I want to do my garden and I could do with a 26 hour day yeah <laughs> so there you are that's basically it amazing so shall we talk a little bit more like about your sewing journey so you got first started sewing on the proper sewing machine at like age four and then six, have you always been six, sewing that whole time six on the sewing machine yes it, it had to be six on the sewing machine because we didn't have one until 1967 so you did like hand sewing stuff all hand sewing. oh yes it was all mum it was it's a bit like um when you dance you do your ballet is your foundations uh when you're music it's very you, you do your this is just the way i did my kids you, you're going through your associated board exams you're doing your theory you're building those grounds and you're going out and building a shoot my mum was insistent if i wanted to sew i needed to learn how to hand sew this is my tacking that I was doing when I came on the thing to you. Amazing. Is the pin. I hand sew and I, I can sew a hand quilt at six to 16 to 18 stitches per inch, if not more, which is small. So I was taught hand sewing. And then once we started on the sewing machines, I shared my mum's. And then I had my first one when I was 18. Amazing. So have you sewn? <laughs> Say again. Have you always sewn since then, since learning? Oh, always, always, always. If I was ever, if I was ever down or low, I would go and sew something. Amazing. 
I've not stopped sewing. Brilliant. Awesome. Really exciting. I feel like I've spoken to some people and they have done sewing a bit as kids and they don't really remember how they picked it up. But then, you know, when they, they have their own family, it sort of drops off a bit and they've recently picked it up. But I think that's amazing that you've got this legacy of sewing like not the whole time. Not Do you want to see something I made when I was about seven? Yeah. Here you go. That's so cute. That was that was, a, that was a equivalent of a year three sewing project. And it, you, know, it, you know, it's on old fashioned bink, but that was done in school, and I have no idea. Oh yes, I think I tried to do a I tried to do a rabbit on it. Amazing. So did they just say, oh, you can do what you want? or yes, they our names and then we could have a go at doing what we wanted, yeah. Brilliant. That's so cute. And that's amazing that you still got it as well. <laughs> it's got my brownie uniform in it. <laughs> it's going back a bit, isn't it? I'm not getting that out. Was your brownie uniform like culottes? Like little, because I had these brown culottes and they were really awful. <laughs> You've got to bear in mind, I went to Brownies in 1968. So there's my brownie badge. Is this like for the neck on the neckerchief? On the neck, yeah, on the neckerchief, yeah. on the neck. Yeah. Amazing. Right. Around the neck. And then I don't know, do they still have there we go. Oh, so you've got like a, this is like a, the shirt. No, it's a dress. There was a belt for it. It was a little dress. So the badges went down. The sleeve like so and flicked on that side so th there's the um there's the sewing badge so did i imagining you sewed all your own badges on no mum did those <laughs> she did those when i went to bed and um i was in the for anybody's there here watching from nottinghamshire i was in the i was in the ruddington girl guides br uh, brownies so there you go so did you get a sewing badge when you were at Brownies? Yeah, it was here. I, I, I thought I found it. Hold on a minute. Of course. Excellent. <laughs> and in guides and in rangers. I went to all of them. You've got to like make the most of the skills that you've already got to rack up the yeah. badges. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I always wanted to get the agility one, but, I, but my parents wouldn't help me do that. They said I wasn't very good at agility. I think I did get the agility badge and I came home like I've got the agility badge and my parents laughed at me because they were like that seems unlikely for you. <laughs> I remember the first one I got in guides was the aircraft badge. Oh, wow what do you do <laughs> for that? <laughs> That's because my dad is uh, dad was absolutely obsessed with aeroplanes as is my brother now and I know I'm safe because he's not watching it. <laughs> not watching it yeah so no i've literally just sewn all my life um there are other dresses upstairs but there's um my parents went to a buckingham palace garden party in 1970 no no not 1979 1981 i think it was 81 i had to go because i was an unmarried daughter over the age of 18 and uh so i made my own dress for that with all pin tucks and everything um we made uh, wedding dresses were made, bridesmaids dresses have been made, you name it, I've probably made it. Amazing. So over your, like all of your years of sewing, what's the most challenging project that you've ever worked on? Right, that's an easy one. It was not my wedding dress, which wow. I do have on the floor behind me, if you wanted it. Because uh, that was 1986 and that was a Chantilly lace wedding dress with a, uh, lace overlay it was lace over over the top of just an ordinary top the most challenging thing i've ever made is this thing and this is a swing coat oh wow a quilted reversible swing coat in i've just realized it's got a little uh, it's coming apart just here that's from my daughter wearing it uh, but it's got an embroidered leaf on the front and then on this side, it's got, this is the most, this was the most interesting. I had to tack everything. I had to tailor's tack every single quilted line, every single positioning line. And this was sewn on and I had to sew down vertically and then cut up in between. And wow. it is literally just a patch on the front of the jacket. 
just a design feature patch. But inside, it's just plain silk. Wow. And this, this fabric is, sorry? The texture is amazing. It is actually three, it's, there's three different fabrics on it. There's the wool, the plain wool, there's the silk, and then there's this bobbly one here. Brilliant. So, so that, and we've got couching on it as well. That was definitely the most challenging thing that I've ever made. Did you make that for a special occasion? No, I saw the pattern on Vogue Patterns and wanted to make it. I fancied it. Amazing. <laughs> That's how I made it. But at well, the time, I was working at Queen Margaret School, which is behind me in York. Um, my, my children were at the village school. And my children were where I at school where I live now. And my um, I was working in the art and textiles department. And we used to go down to London for trips, um, fashion trips. So it was the V&A and then uh, Berwick Street for the set for Soho. And I just picked up the fabric when I was down in Zoho one time. Amazing. It was, just, it was definitely, and then it's got silk wadding in it. But it was definitely the most complicated thing. But my daughter now wears it because she has to go to a lot of functions with her husband's job. So she tends to wear it now. Brilliant. So it's kind of like a formal, like a dress coat type thing. Yeah, it's got the most amazing fastening, actually. I'll show you the fastening. Um, the fastening is a huge bound eyelet. Look at that. Oh, wow. It? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Where yeah, is it? You're all backwards. Uh, like <laughs> it's like a bound thing. So on this side, you've got the binding. And on that side, you've just got a hole. Can you see? Where is it going? Yeah. There it is. Just Pretty a cool. hole. I think my favourite part of this is that you just made it because you fancied it. <laughs> like the most complicated <laughs> way it was. Like, I feel like it. It was, it was like David was like, you have to make the hard things, don't you? I was like, yeah, but it's no fun if I don't. My latest, most challenging make, I would put the pogo nip in there. Because of the construction or the especially fabric? If especially if you're making it with a knit fabric and a welt pocket. And I'm going to advertise, but I did do a vlog on it, on how to sort it out. Okay, so you figured it out with all your experience. That's good yeah. to know. Yeah, read the, 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 the welt pocket instructions. So if you use my tips along with what's on the video, you'll get it right. Amazing. That's yes. brilliant. Right. It's, just, it's just things that when, when I was, a welt pocket is nothing but more than a large bound buttonhole. And you have to sew round a bound buttonhole. So you sew round a welt pocket. So. Yeah, I think when you, or like certainly from my perspective, when you learn to sew on a machine, then my patience for hand sewing is very low because it takes so long. So I feel like your mum had the right idea teaching you hand sewing first. And so then you can get good at that and then it doesn't take as long. <laughs> I think that's definitely and it doesn't and it, it never goes because I've just altered a dress for a lady in the village. She's 80 something or other. But she's getting the Royal Maundy money next week. And she wants to wear a dress that her sister made for her many years ago. So when Nancy's daughter got married, her sister made this dress for her. And the sister now has dementia. So it's like she's taking her sister with her to the service. Oh. But the dress is too too long. So I've shortened it, but I've hand sewn the hem. Amazing. That's really special that you can then like. It is really special. But being able to do a blind hand stitched hem, is, it, it's something that we all need to be able to do. And it's it's a skill that's going to go if we don't. We can't always do things on our sewing machines. Yeah. There is a time and a place for a hand stitch. Definitely. When you want a really like high, high end finish as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Because I did City and Guilds fashion, which is good your sewing. Amazing. Right. Speaking of couture sewing, do you want to show us your wedding gown? My wedding gown? Yeah, we've got a few people in the chat that are keen to see it. Oh, well, OK. So this fabric came. Oh, it's got other things inside it. I've forgotten about this. Oh, I've got the Buckingham Palace dress in here. Oh, wow. Buckingham Palace dress. I'm just wondering if I've got something else in here that I've been looking for for years. No, I haven't. I've got a dress that I made for my niece. And... Okay, so the wedding dress is here. So this fabric came from a shop that is no longer around. It's from a company that was on 
Duke Street, which is just off Ox Oxford Street near the Marble Arch end. And we bought two bolts of Chantilly lace. And I swear it is exactly the same Chantilly lace that Kate had when she married William. Oh, wow. Yeah, for the sleeves. So, yes. And my sleeves were the same look. Oh, beautiful. But it had a Diana-esque ruffle down the front because this was 1986 and this is what Vogue patterns had. And a, uh, a ruffle-ish ruffle thing around the neck, which was Diana-esque. And um, very tightly fitted sleeves. And then underneath the skirt here is just some silk. And um, then just a frill down the side. Beautiful. But, yeah. But when you're sewing with anything like this, I always take the view that if you treat the fabric with respect, it will respect you back and it'll work. Yeah. So was it very expensive, the lace that you bought? Yeah, I know exactly how much it was. We bought 10 metres, okay, in 1986, and it was £25 a metre. It was £250. Wow. Dread to think what it would cost now. But know, it is still intact. And I made a christening gown for my daughter. Um, my son was christened in the Watson family christening gown. My daughter has her own. Oh, that's really cute. So you made it from the same fabric? Yes, I made it from a scrap. I'm going to try. I've not, not cut this up. This has not been cut at all. Yeah, that's really good that you um, that you had a spare. That's a, one of the, the pros of making your own dress is that you don't have to destroy it to make the christening gown. You don't, no, if that's if you want to, if you're feeling that that's what you want to do. So my daughter is expecting next month and she will use that christening gown for her children. I've just done a, an inflation calculator to see how much oh gosh. £250 would be in like today's money. Are you ready? £714 for your 10 metres of lace. Well, not bad. I don't think you could get 10 metres of lace for, lace for £14. Should, oh, I don't know. No, um, the last time I looked at lace on Joel and Son, I think you were looking at £250 a metre, mm. depending on the type of lace. Wow. Do you want to see the, the palace dress? Yeah. This is what I, this is a birder pattern. And again, it's got those undertones in, influenced by Diana because it's got, when she first came to the royal family, she had high neck with little ruffles on and buttons down the front, a little yoke, and then look at these pin, it's got pin tucks down. Oh, my light's in the way. Can you see the little pin tucks? It's got the, I can't even find the pin tucks, there they are. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, they look so good. So, and that was just a cotton lawn for, that I got from a shop in Beverly, because that's where we were living at the time. Amazing. We you... have a right mess. Dogs better not come and go on the floor down here, because I'm throwing everything down. Um, were you like excited to go to this Buckingham Palace thing because you could make a fancy dress for it, or were you like making fancy dresses anyway? You really want to know what happened about the Buckingham Palace garden party? Yeah. My brother and I ribbed my mother mercilessly about this Buckingham Palace garden party, and my father let us get away with so much, and then one day he clearly had enough of this ribbing and said quite bluntly, well, I don't know why you're keeping at it and looking at me. He said, because you're going to, because you're an unmarried daughter over the age of 18. And it was all to do with wearing a hat. <laughs> so, yes, my mum bought a dress from uh, an outfit in Outfitters in York, which is long gone. It was a little local designer in York called Vivian Smith. She bought her dress from there. And she then subsequently wore the same dress from my brother's wedding. And then um, I made my own. So, so it was and at the time it was nobody the booking and palace was open to the public so there was never a chance that you'd get inside it and i remember my dad saying you'll never get inside here again take everything in yeah. we slow as we could he said we'll never get in here again and then shortly after my mum died he got asked to another one so his second wife went oh nice he went, he went twice yes <laughs> it was to do his job he was a chartered engineer, so, yeah. Brilliant. Right, shall we talk a little bit about your stash? Oh, my stash. All 60 pieces of fabric of it. 
That's 60 pieces. That is not big. We've, uh, I think the record on stash chats for the largest stash is around 600. So, well, did you, anybody see the Stacey Dooley program last? Not Stacey Dooley, Stacey Solomon when she sorted out the house. I so heard they, on, on a Facebook. She had 900 pieces of fabric and they laid them all out in a, in a warehouse uh, in Lincolnshire. I love it when they do that sort of thing on TV shows, but when they do it really weirdly, when they're like, this is how much cheese you eat in a year and it's just like thousands of bits of cheese and you're just like okay thank you i think they tried to work out how much the fabric was that she got i'm thinking don't even go there so yes my stash what would you like to know about my stash yeah so how are you organized now it's completely organized amazing mm -hmm. thanks to stash hub and that's not an advertisement i dis i was i had um one of my many chest infections earlier in the year and sat down and thought, I can't do anything else. I'm going to sort my stash out. So I did. Yeah. Amazing. So I literally went through every piece. Um, what I didn't want, I de-stashed. What I did want, I put on. And then I folded it up and it wasn't allowed to go back into the, the, the sewing space until such time as it had been catalogued. And then it rolled and it went back into either the jersey section the woven section or just for Rachel from stitched up the Atelier brunette cupboard. <laughs> so you've got a bit of a weakness for the Atelier brunette designs then. Yes, I've stopped because I don't need any more. Is it the like the designs and the prints that you like or the quality? I or... like the way that it all works together. Mm. It, the the colour palette will work. So it doesn't matter which bit you pick from which bit, they'll all work together. Yeah, so it ca caps your wardrobe energy. It is, it very much so. But I have so much I don't need any more. And like, I mean, I said, say I have so much. Oh, pieces just fallen out. Probably about 20 pieces. I mean, if that's a significant percentage of your stash, if you've got 20 <laughs> Um, but that's quite a lot that you've got then that all you know easily goes together. It does, so, and most of it I do know what I want to make with it. So when you did your clear out, did you find there was a lot that you wanted to get rid of, or just no, not? There wasn't a lot. There wasn't as much as I thought there was. Um, no, there wasn't as much as I thought. Um, there were bits that I bought because I felt obliged to buy. Um, you see on Instagram and people are advertising this fabric and that fabric and you think at the moment you think oh yes I'd really like that that would be great and you buy it and then you think what have I bought it for yeah like, well, I, um, I like this I just bought it because it was limited edition <laughs> yes that, I'm I'm a horrendous limited edition I tell you Bruno oh I need to have it <laughs> and I'm trying to say no you don't need to have it because you're 62 years of age now. How many garments can you sew a year? How many clothes can you get through a year? How long is this going to last for the rest of your life? Yeah. It sounds ridiculous, but that is just one of those silly things that's gone through my mind. And it does focus your mind as to what you need to spend your money on and what you don't need to spend your money on. Yeah. And so have you, on. have you always had like a stash or has that something that's sort of grown no. more? I haven't always had a stash. Stashes didn't exist in the 1970s, 80s, 90s and noughties. I never had a stash. Um, I would have had maybe maximum three pieces. So would and you just I buy and then do the project and then buy something else? Absolutely. That's how it used to work. You wanted a blouse, right, let's go and have a look. You'd go into the shop, you'd look at the pattern books, you'd choose your big four, buy your fabric, buy your cotton, your thread by your notions and that would be it i don't think the concept of a stash came into my vocabulary until, until about two, 2018 yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, I'm thinking rather personally now i had a, i had a huge nervous breakdown i think it I think it was the summer of 17 and that's when I started to buy that's when my stash started to grow yeah that's when I mean, I discovered that people were doing YouTube videos and had fabric stashes and I thought oh I've got to one of those I think it's like online isn't it and the whole idea of stuff being like limited edition and and like because I think if you if you go to the fabric shop because you need to buy fabric for a project 
and they already sold out of a fabric it's like i didn't know about that so because i didn't need anything so i didn't go to the mm-hmm. shops i didn't see it so i don't miss it in my stash but now yeah. everything's online and you keep seeing this fabric and you're like okay i've got to get it because yeah. adele says they're the same with see you at six because i know they do like limited collection drops as well i um, can't see which adele is that uh adele seaman oh yes hi adele see you on saturday <laughs> um this one is the one I like, yeah. yeah so i think it's um it is really easy to just like accumulate stuff with the pace of buying mm-hmm. things online i did actually pick up some fantastic see you at six i wonder if hold on is it in that cupboard no that's the wrong cupboard i can't quite grab it but it was the most gorgeous rust coloured see you at six fabric at the Isoso t- studio in Sheffield on her swap table. Absolutely. Ooh, wow. Wow. I know three and a half metres of it. That's a dream that is. <laughs> that was a dream. And, and it's literally, it was just be- beautiful. Absolutely. It's a caramel colour. Not a colour I'd go for, but absolutely gorgeous. Really, really beautiful. Really beautiful really lovely so do you tend to buy most of your fabric online now or do you most most of it most of it yes um i am going to the stitch festival on saturday but i am not i don't intend to buy fabric patterns yes fabrics no i have some balenciaga fabric from mood oh wow in do you want to see that one now yeah hold on i'm gonna have to bend down because it's it's behind the box of the sewing of the wedding dress, which is thought I mended my sewing dress. It's in here. Hold on. I'm just looking to see if the CU at six is in here as well. Yeah, we can have a I don't know where the CU at six has gone, but it's definitely around here somewhere. <laughs> that one. Oh here it is. This is the see you at six. Look at that. Oh wow, it's nice. Orange. Look at that one. Look at that. That was incredible. To get yeah, that. They've got such a specific colour palette. It's a similar thing with um Atelier Jupe and Atelier Brunette. They've got their like colour palettes. They've always got a little bit of coral, I think, in the see you so at six. I thought it was caramel, but it's coral. So the Balenciaga fabric. I asked my daughter for Christmas in 20, Christmas 22. They had the honeymoon, a, a bit delayed honeymoon because of COVID. And they went to New York for five days. What did I want? I said, I'll have a piece of fabric from Mood for Christmas. Look at that. Did you brief them at all in like no, what fabric? No, not at all. Not at all. Thing. And in fact, Michael chose it. So this is what I'm buying a pattern for at the Stitch Festival. And I'm thinking the summer in New York dress. Oh, um, Seasons of East. Yeah. Seasons of East. Is it summer in New York or autumn in New York dress? I th- I want to say summer. I uh, think. Or, that- or the other alternative is the peony dress by Fabric Godmother. Yes, I'll I'll be wearing a peony on Saturday. All right, you can influence me then. Come and see um, me if you like it. <laughs> um, that is that is for the gathering in april yes and a wedding the week before brilliant you're like getting the most out of it then absolutely i'm absolutely <laughs> lining everything up at the moment so I is want it silk to... fabric say is it silk fabric no it's polyester believe it or not it looks really shiny and luxe though it looks great it, it, it feels amazing i mean this fabric here that i'm sewing at the moment some people will recognize it and this is a tensile from rainbow fabrics it's absolutely gorgeous but it's awful to sew with i'm not going to put it down because i'm going to fall out with it before the end of the evening i think as long as i can get the zip in it tonight i'll feel happy <laughs> Oh, zips. You'll have to be doing a zip after 9 p.m. I feel like I've got quite an early cut off of doing a zip. Oh, God. I have my own way for doing an invisible zip. 
it's not the way that all the patterns tell you to do it now. I, in fact, I use the Kenneth King method and I only discovered it was the Kenneth King method when I decided to Google invisible zips and saw him doing it. But I was taught how to do it in 1994 at the City and Guilds course. So, oh, wow. So What's the doing... play then? Can you give us a, qu a quick run through of how it works? Uh, my invisible zip? Yeah, def definitely. But people might not like it. So this is the way I do it, and it works for me. And there is on my YouTube channel a blog. Jess from So What If I Sew? Yeah. I'm probably, I'm probably worked out I'm a bit of a fan of Jess. But Jess uh, asked me, she was doing a top tips season of videos about three or four years ago. And I said I'd do zips. So I did a whole load of zips. But my secret for zips is all zips. Sew at the seam first. Because what you're doing is, you're putting a closure in a zip in a seam and a seam is in order for it to be on a garment needs to be closed so if you want it to match up perfectly across the middle you have to close the seam before you put the zip in so oh, she says trying to find the zip on this thing this dress is this is the lowest dress by Tissuti patterns that i'm making and believe it or not, I bought this fabric and the pattern at the Stitch Festival last year and I thought I need to get it made. Yeah. <laughs> but when you've got something like this where it goes across the middle. Yeah, where it goes over the seam. Yeah, and the zip is there. How are yeah. you going to get those two to join up across the top if you don't close the seam first? So you close the seam on a basting stitch and then you carefully lay the, the zip over the top and then you have to carefully tack down the stitches here the um tape the seam allowance then you open it up and then you roll the bits back and sew them down as you would do ordinary uh with the other methods rather than just going straight into putting it on the edge of the seam and sewing down sewing down the other side and hoping to goodness those bits will meet in the middle this is you rest guaranteed brilliant so I'm trying that next time. extra stages but it's adding in a guarantee. And then when you're going across the middle where you top to your bottom joins, if you can't get it to match up, what you need to do is to lay one on top of the other and flat tack it by about an inch and a half, maybe three, four centimetres in, so you know it's absolutely solid, then sew the seam down. Undo that flat tacking across the middle and you'll see it joins up. Amazing. I feel I just, like the time you spend doing these, these things, like the hand sewing, the tacking, you'd probably say like it probably takes less time than unpicking it all when it doesn't match up <laughs> yeah i tacked on the pogo nip and it, i tacked loads on the pogo nip and the whole thing went in first time amazing yeah right, you've got, i i'm a i'm a firm believer in tacking i'll just read these comments um, so adele was saying about the the patterns from seasons of east the summer has the big sleeves and the autumn has the go days oh it's the big sleeves it's the one adele's doing summer yeah it's the one adele's doing have you done it yet adele that's a big question find out tomorrow yeah <laughs> see what see what adele's wearing on saturday no no um we're on the zoom call tomorrow adele we with get, adele get, and yeah the get the low down before the show <laughs> yes and got some more questions so so jojo says a school friend of mine her mother used to work for a company that printed fabric for homeware and she'd give us lots of lovely fabric in the mid 80s i've still got quite a bit left jojo has been so jojo has been saying for ages i know jojo from camping when i discovered that that joe had a sewing machine in her tent and my <laughs> husband went don't you even go there joe and adam used to camp next to david and i in a place in cornwall amazing how does that even work is it like a battery powered one like a hand one we had electric hookups oh my goodness that's not camping <laughs> that's cheating sensible camping they've got a camper van now amazing um right so we have a look at some more of your stash yes what would you like this time let's have a look tell me oh, what you'd like no, adele says they've cut themselves with the rotary cutter last night so they haven't started their summer in new york dress yet Oh, I hope it's not too sore. Never tell Jan, unless Jan's watching. <laughs> um, what would you like? Do you want to see my latest fabric? Yeah, let's see. Let's start with the latest. We'll go latest and then oldest. It's it's a Jersey Easter eggs. 
Oh, very seasonal. I've only got half a metre because, as I said to my daughter-in-law, how long is Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a, a, a like a vest, a t-shirt romper baby grow. It's going to be a, a vest with poppers underneath. Nice. And that's going to be really cute then. Yes, that's his Easter egg. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you can't give him chocolate if he's just a little baby. So oh, he's only 14 weeks old. Or is he 15 oh, weeks tiny old? Tiny baby. He's cute. Yeah, I don't get any grandchildren for ages and I get two at once. <laughs> so now you've got loads of sewing for kids to do. It's like my, my in-laws, they, they were waiting forever for great-grandchildren. They've got three. We just had Oliver and they've got two next month. There's, Hannah's having a, 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 and my niece are all is pregnant as well. All due at the same time. Well, that'll be good because then all the cousins will be the same age and it'll yes. be fun. Yeah. So I have th I have quite a few others. Let me show you the oldest first. The one I showed you when I came on. And I know that my, I'm, I've got my chair on it. Oh, no. My, my son is not watching this, so. Okay. He he did a clarinet solo when he was fifteen, and he wanted a musical note waistcoat. Amazing! So I have quite a bit. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And for anybody up in the north, it came from boys, and I bought this. Oh my gosh, seventeen, eighteen years ago, and it was about four pounds a meter then. So, and it's that awful acetate satin stuff. It will slip everywhere but from there the next oldest one i've got i got and i was trying to work out when we set this up when i might have bought this but it came from the fabric godmother i think it was 2015 and she said she had some mizoni i've got some mizoni fabric and i don't know what to make with it is it I like a knit it's a knit it's a knit. I've got probably a metre and a half. No, yes, a metre and a half. So this is what needs a pattern. Yeah, let um, us know in the chat what you think Judy should make with this. I love the colours. Well, I didn't know what I was buying. She just said, I'm getting some misuse before she got as big as she does is now. And I just saw it and I thought, oh, I really, f it came up in a, on a, an email, an email newsletter. Amazing. I don't think it's pure, it won't be pure wool because it'll be in acrylic. It'll be a designer acrylic. Um, then I went to Linton's in uh, Berwick, Ber Pontweed, not Berwick, Pontweed, Carlisle, near Carlisle. And we all know who Linton Tweed's made for, don't we? So this is Chanel. Oh, lovely. I love this little bit of sparkle. I know what I'm making. That's a, a Chanel skirt. And that's, that's just a white Chanel. Amazing. Have you seen the Chanel exhibition at the V&A? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's my Christmas present from my daughter. And son-in-law. Yeah, it's really good, isn't it? Did you go? Yeah, I've seen it. Anybody that's interested in Chanel needs this book. Oh, is so it? Like it's how neat. to make a Chanel jacket. Amazing. Yeah, that's the one to get there. And then we go to the other extreme. And I bought this only five years ago. <laughs> like... Anybody like to guess how much I paid a meter for it? Because I think I've got the bill here. Is there a bill for this one here? No, this isn't for this one. No, that's for the other one I showed. This one here is Italian. It's an Italian linen. Oh, nice. And it was a crazy amount of money. Crazy amount of money. 54 a metre. 
I don't know why I bought it. I must have had a very weak moment, and then I've got a treat. <laughs> it was a treat. I was buying for my daughter, my niece's wedding, and then this is another one I bought from the same place. This is a stretch denim, and that's been in my stash not as long actually. It within again within the last five years. So, so have you to make with either of those? Have you done jeans making? I have. I will go back to jeans making when I retire. Because at the moment, I feel as if my time is so pressurised to try and get everything in. It's the one thing. I'd have to stop doing everything else while I just focused on jeans making. And I don't want to do that at the moment. What is it that's like so time consuming? Is it because of all the details, like all the top stitching, or is it like the it's fitting? To focus on it with no other distractions. Yeah. A lot of sewing needs to focus. You need to be able to give it time. You can't. I'm not one of these people that can rush a garment, even though I'm rushing this lowest dress, burning the midnight oil. But um, I like the process of sewing. I like the process of the cutting out, the matching up, and it is the construction and putting it together so that it is as fine, fine as it can be. It's the difference between handmade and homemade. Yeah. And that's going back to my childhood in the 60s, that things were made with care and time was taken. Um, that's how I was taught to sew. Have you found that the attitudes like towards clothes in general has changed a lot, like between the 60s and now? In which respect? Like, do you feel like people respect their like wardrobes less now and like have more clothes and they don't care? I think it's, I think it's very consumeristic at the moment. I think there's um, fast fashion is now happening in sewing. Yeah. Uh, it's the advent of the home overlocker and the ease of getting New Jersey fabrics. When you go into that Chanel exhibition, the first thing you see is that silk jersey blouse. And oh, to be able to recreate that. Uh, and that was not sewn with Maraflex thread. It was not sewn on an overlocker. It was sewn on a standard sewing machine. And the, it was just a question that that fabric was jersey to give fluidity and to give comfort when you were wearing it, not for it to stretch with you. And I feel that now it's so easy to if you want a jumper just whip one up on your overlocker but even whipping a jumper up on the overlocker i wouldn't do it in an evening i'd probably give myself three evenings so that i could take my time in cutting it out and making certain i've got the neck band on properly and <coughs> and then doing neck stitching top stitching with the cover stitch machine and just taking my time i'm not a maraflex fan have I you tried it I have tried it, but I've got an over a cover stitch, so I tend to just go for that. Yeah, I think that gives you more of like the professional fini finish. It gives you a professional finish. But Maraflex, if you've not got a cover stitch, if I didn't have a cover stitch, I probably would be a Maraflex fan. But because I've got the cover stitch, it's like, well, if I use that, and what am I going to do with that? Yeah. Is and I think it gives people an option. Yeah. With the cover stitch, do you mostly just use it when you're sewing jersey? Yes. I could be more adventurous with it. I could be more adventurous with it. I don't feel I've got the most out of it. My overlocker, on the other hand, I get so much out of it. Yeah. So much out of it because I went into flat locking to make sportswear. As I made a toaster sweater... And I flat locked all the seams and um, Peggy, because I know the lady who owns So House 7, she was like, I couldn't believe you did that. And I said, all I did was change the stitch on my overlocker. It was, And I had an athletic fabric, I had a wattle and slate jersey, and it made it beautifully. But it's, it, And I can remember, I had um, it was it, um, Angela at Devon Threadtails wanted to do some flat locking. And she didn't know if her overlocker could do it. But I said, I said tell me what it is and I'll work out if it can. And it's the same as my daughter-in-law's and hers can. So Angela managed to do it. And it is so easy. It's just another function of your, of your machine. And so you know, go, going going back to your original question, yes, I think it is possible to quickly make things now. 
and if people want to be able to change their garments as quickly as they can by get, getting them in Primark. I'm not saying that their sewing is the same level as Primark's, but it's just an analogy. In Primark, you can change your outfit quickly and quickly and quickly, but you can with sewing because you can sew with jersey, you can make it with, with your, your overlocker and you can get it together quickly. Perfect. Yeah. So Adele says, oh, what's your, what's your favourite thing to sew? Favourite thing to sew? I think my favourite thing to sew is a dress or a blouse that takes your time and that you can put some thought into it, like this one. Like some this. nice details. So on this one here, I um, this is a regalia blouse um, from Sew House 7. And I've made three because I tested round one and round two. So on this one, I've taken off the neckline, I've taken off the collar. It's actually now too big for me. Um, it's about three sizes too big for me. Um, so when I did this, the neckline did sit completely round here because the little collar is meant to sit round. So what I did was when I cut it, I cut down to the, here and I dropped from the, the shoulder down to the front by 1.5 centimetres just to give myself a lower neckline. I edged it with a little bit of lace and then at the top here, at the bottom of the where the burrito neck uh, yoke is, put a bit of piping. And I also put piping on the sleeve as well. You can't really see it, just in there. So it's taking a woven garment and taking my time and putting features into it. This is what I made for Sew Blouse April last year. Yeah. I wonder if they're doing that this year. I don't know. Yeah, they are. Ro Rowan has uh, messaged me and asked me if I'd like to do a vlog. And I've had to say no because Hannah's baby's due next month. So I didn't want any pressure in April. Yeah, that's but fair enough. Got to make for the gathering and a wedding, which is why it's one dress, two things. Yeah. When you do like pattern tests, do you feel like um do, like do you reply and say, oh, maybe you should tell them to like tack this and like change the, you know, put in no. your tip, uh, no. just make sure that it works, and you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> follow, the, follow the instructions to the letter. So when I did the mizzle dress for Victoria. Um, I worked out an easier way of doing the top stitching, line of top stitching when you put the bottom on the top. And anybody that watches me will know that I pontificate on about your built-in free sewing tool in your sewing machine, which is your free arm. And slide it onto you, take your extension table off, and you, your free arm's only about that big. And you put, if you put something underneath, you'll know, and you can just slide it round. I mean, I've got these little cuffs to put on this dress here. And that will go through my free arm, no problem at all. And you can sew round in a circle. And that was my biggest thing that I wanted when I got my first sewing machine was a free arm. I feel like, yeah, that's a good point. Cause I I just forget about the free arm, just faff mm -hmm. about with sleeves, making sure the bits out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revive the free arm. Revive the free arm. Go when the free arm came and it was like, yes. Um, so I did for Victoria, but I did that rather differently because I actually we had a Facebook group, so I popped it in that. And I haven't checked the instructions to see if Victoria would mention that. But um, certainly with with Peggy, no, I, I would politely say I think you could do it this way or you could do it another way. When I've tested for Izzy at Isoso, I when she did her first pattern test, I spent a long time telling her how I would put in the zip to make it work and then sew the lining down by hand separately so that the whole of the zip was encased in the lining that that's just how I would work I mean you you can't you because the way I put the zip in you couldn't put this you couldn't catch the lining in with it I mean that's one thing I would like to work out I'm sure you could do but if you've not got it right to the top you've got that little gap at the top and then there's like it is on this dress and then the zip starts halfway down mm. just so that it's around the waist so so yes, I do. I do give tips, as well as spelling mistakes and English <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Um, right. Let's see what. Else. So Pam says, which is the fabric you're not going to be adding to stash up? That one. Oh, your new one, because you're gonna make, make it, it up. Make it. Well, oh no, actually, I probably will retrospectively add it because I'm also recording my projects. Um, the special fabrics aren't on Stash Hub at the moment, but they should be. Um, I don't know if you've got Joel and Sonny in your drop-down list of shops. 
because <laughs> it's not one that people tend to go to but it is a lovely lovely fabric shop if you're ever in london in church and you can get to church street just go and have a look just go and breathe it in the, well the drop down list is a list of all of your shops Ooh. so, so it's say it will suggest only the shops that you've used so all oh, right oh, I um, yes yeah, so you have to get it in there um jane says that she pr prefers cover stitch too to doing the flat lock i suppose or to doing maraflex probably yeah get that good finish what's elizabeth say elizabeth says do you have a favorite type of fabric to sew with e.g viscose or cotton i think if i'm being if i'm sewing viscose i like a quality viscose this is nice i Oh, this is one that Andrew, because I most of my fabric purchases <coughs> at the moment are just from Beyond the Pink Door, because I'm trying not to buy fabric because I want to use what I've got. But I get her box. So this is a one that Andrew uses. It's a creative one. And it's a really lovely, solid weight. And it's got, it doesn't slide too much. Mm. Um, we did get one in the Pink Door boxes that did slide a lot. And I put a tip out to... Tack, uh, to tape your fabric to your cutting surface with masking tape so that it doesn't move so i would say either a quality viscose or a cotton cotton lawn would be nice yeah i feel like especially if you're doing like a blouse with lots of <coughs> it's really nice like cotton lawn and then it's you can it presses nicely and you can get all oh, the little this this tensile from rainbow fabrics is is going together nicely but it won't be a patch on sewing with this linen, will it? <laughs> Have you got an idea for that linen? No, nothing. All right, nothing so we need ideas. We need, yeah, we need, so we need suggestions for the linen, and we need suggestions for the Missoni knit as well. Yeah, I think the linen could become the um, tea house top and dress by Sew House Seven. Oh, lovely. It could be that one. That would look nice as that. Um, that could be that could be one I could make with that one. But as for the Mizoni, I'm completely at a loss. And the denim isn't going to be jeans. It's mm -hmm. too good for jeans. It needs to be a pinafore. I think I was thinking Ivy Pinafore by Jennifer Lauren when I bought that. Oh, that would be nice. Quite a while since I bought that. So that's, that's roughly where I'm going with that. I do like a linen. I do like a nice linen. I like an Atelier Brunette linen. And the Atelier Brunette fabrics have got quite a bit of substance to them, so they don't move around as much. But I always, I, I don't like to sort of say that I like a better quality or a heavier weight, because like I said with the lace, if you respect the fabric, it will pay you back tenfold. And never be frightened to cut into a what you might call a precious fabric. It doesn't matter. It's just it's just a piece of fabric. Were you stressed making your wedding dress, or do no, you? No, not at all. Yes. Not at all. No. 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 Not at all. No. I did have some very good helpers with me when I made my wedding dress. I had a good close family friends a couple of close family friends that helped me out and there was um my friend lynn my school friend lynn her mum was a tailoress and i learned an awful lot from her when i was sort of 16 to 20 i learned an awful lot from pat and there's an awful lot to be learned, said for it's just the same now people are learning from youtube i learned from word of mouth the old-fashioned way go down and knock on Auntie Dot's door three doors down the street and now you'd be looking at, well, who's done this and who's done that? It's exactly the same thing. It's word of mouth. Amazing. Changed. Just, it's just the uh, voice piece for it, the mouthpiece for it. It's exactly the same. That's really good. Well, we've got a couple of suggestions for the Missoni. Oh, so Lisa and Elizabeth both think you should make a cardigan with it, like a long drapey cardigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What sort of drapey cardigan there? A yeah, pattern. Have you pattern suggestions. It can't have darts in it. Yeah. Because otherwise you're going to go across the, the line. Maybe I should go on the Mizoni website and see what they suggest. Mm. 
Yeah, it's such a unique fabric. That's probably why it's difficult to decide like what to make with it. I think it was an opportunity <clears throat> to get hold of it that I took. It cost me £36, I do know that. I love that you can remember how much everything was as well. I feel like... Yeah, it... that's called widowhood. You tend to remember exactly how much things were when you're a widow because you think, oh, God, can I afford that? And can I afford this? You do tend to remember. I've got a memory for things like that. I can remember a lot. So definitely ideas for the Mizoni, please. And if, if they don't, I'll pick them up from here and I'm sure you can drop them down to me if I don't see them. But definitely, I'd get, that is the one fabric. I don't even know where I've thrown it now. I think I'll send you a picture of it afterwards to show you what my kitchen floor looks like. <laughs> yeah, you have to organise after this. Oh, it's right over here. Here it is. Hold on. It didn't make the floor. It made the side. I think it might need lining as well. What yeah. Do you think? I mean, I guess if you use it for like a cardigan, then you'll be wearing it over the top of other stuff, so you wouldn't have to worry about lining it. Yeah. What do you think? I think it's one of those fabrics and you're going to have to like here yeah, you're going to have to match the stripes up so they're not all going to match up perfectly so if you match the green and the orange they all go out of alignment so it's one of those that's going to have to pattern match across so it's going to be so so difficult to to, to decide what to make with it maybe I should go to Josie and say I bought from you <laughs> Many years ago, some Mizoni fabric. I mean, surely somebody who somebody else who bought it must have sewn it up. So yeah, maybe, maybe I should do it on my YouTube channel saying, has anybody bought this from Fabric Gone with what did you make? Yeah. It's Come on, guys, really... 10 years. What have you made? <laughs> and it's got a lovely edging to it. Can you see the edging? The oh, yeah. so you won't need to hem it if you use no. that edge. No, you don't need to hem it. And I just showed you that. No, I did show you the right side. Have you had other people with interesting fabrics coming on? Yeah, everyone's got, you know, special fabrics. Um, I think probably the most craziest <coughs> one was um, Gina Marie from Stitch Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah, she has um, this silk that was like hand woven by her great grandmother, I think. And um, so she like grew, like she raised the silkworms and like collected the silk and oh my I don't know, made, into fibers and made this fabric um, that she's like now inherited. So I was just like, oh my gosh. I think so if it's that old, you'd struggle for its durability and the fragility. Because although fabric does survive, it can start to break down and disintegrate. And, you know, silk is one of those that will do yeah i don't know if it makes a difference like how you store it and stuff like that but um. acid free acid free wrapped in acid free paper in a humidity temperature controlled chamber i think is how i, I would handle it with your white gloves on <laughs> you know you, you look at them in the vna in the textile galleries but castle have got everything in white gloves up there so yeah it's roughly how it would work yeah but I think it gets to a point where like some, you know, everyone's got fabric in their stash that they've had for such a long time that now it becomes like too precious. Like it, the more, the longer you keep it, the like higher the stakes are for when you use it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I have, when I, when I started to look at that, I thought I've actually done quite well because I don't think I can go over 10 years. And then I found the musical note fabric. I feel like you need to like make your son a coat or something <laughs> as a lining. <laughs> I think I don't think I'd be very popular. I think <laughs> used to forget about it. It's the sort of fabric that when he's sixty, I might say to his son, "Right, Oliver, if you want to embarrass your dad, show him this." He's like, "Right, this week I'm making a waistcoat, and you're learning the clarinet." And they're like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did it. He was he played. Um, I was 15 he played mozart's second movement at mozart's clarinet concerto uh, in 15 and he did it with a with the local youth orchestra amazing the next time we did a solo we did it with a full tux on because he was 18 at that point so yeah that wasn't long before his dad died actually so it's quite quite that one's quite emotional yeah so, 
That's amazing. Yeah. Does he still play in music? <laughs> he was over on Sunday rehearsing. He came over to rehearse before he went off. He had a he's in a sax quartet now. Um and he does he does still play in the Yorkshire Wind Orchestra. Um he's in the in the clarinets. Was the first day. Yeah. Oh he did music at university. Amazing. Yeah, very musical. So I say he the first thing I think he ever read was a book on Shostakovich, and the first thing he actually wanted to read of his own free will was a score to Lohengrin or something. So he's like these words they make no sense these little squiggles on the on the Actually, stage you know exactly what they all are yep and i can read that i can tell you what that tune is i can hum it out you know but don't ask me about the words i'm not interested brilliant so i'd much rather having a set of instructions yeah <laughs> work work my way through that that's what i'm that's what i'm one for so yeah oh amazing well thank you <laughs> Thank you so much of us today, Judy. Really, really amazing to hear about your sewing journey and your stash and your special fabrics. Um, and yeah, keep commenting. Um, even if you're watching on catch up, just comment your suggestions as well for Judy's um, mm -hmm. Sony fabric. We've got to get that sewn. Here we go. This yeah. is your last chance to to decide what what's the uh, what's going to happen with it. I feel like we need to, yeah, need to make that a challenge. <laughs> Yes, maybe I should walk around with it at the stitch vessel and say, have you got a pattern for this or a pattern for this? Yeah. Someone yeah. want to think lug it down to London. You're like Fabric Godmother, they're just over there, but I did buy it like 10 years ago, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're selling this, what do you suggest we make with it? I rather liked it, so I bought it. <laughs> and that's what Stash, I mean, I was watching, reading what you you put up for your Stash, stash Hub suggestions for going to a stitch show. I'm following it to the letter. I've got a budget, I know what I want to buy, and that's it. Yeah. And you've got your friends to come with you as well, so you're doing the socialising part. Yes, I I do. I've got um I've got a friend who said she's coming today that I didn't expect to come, which is wonderful. Um, and then um, my friend Mel's coming as well from the village, and I'm meeting up with one or two other friends when we get down there. Not one or two, a heck of a lot. Loads of them. You'll be a big crowd going around. You'll crowd. Well, we'll be one of many big crowds going around. From what I've heard, there's loads of crowds going around. So I think we'll just be part of the crowd. Excellent. All right. I'll brace myself. Hello. What I do say is do say hello and tell me who you are because yeah. I went to one social and somebody said, oh, I'm so pleased you're here because if it wasn't for you, I'd never have come. And I was like, that's fine. But who? tell me your name, please. <laughs> like, yeah, I'd like to see you <laughs> it's just just say it's great to see you i watch you i'm such and such because obviously you recognize us but we don't recognize you so tell us who you are yes <laughs> that is a good tip i think it's good to just say who you are as well i feel like it does no harm even if someone does know who you are if you just say oh i'm yvette they're like yeah great <laughs> you know yeah. it's I saw Tilly walking around the Stitch Festival last year and she looked so lonely, but I, I couldn't, from where I was, go and speak to her. And she was just wandering around on her own and I just thought, nobody's speaking to you and I'm one of them not speaking to you and I felt awful about that. Yeah, I think Tilly's actually quite shy in person. Yeah, she's very tiny. Yeah. She's tiny, she's a tiny little dot. It's so funny seeing people in person because... You, you hear them speak and you know what they look like, but you don't know how tall anyone is. So then when you meet someone, you're like, oh gosh, you're really tall. Everyone meets me and they're like, oh, I didn't think you were that short. I'm like, yep, because <laughs> I'm only five foot two. All right, I've, there's, there's other people coming in my party that are five foot two, so you will be okay. Do not they worry. Come stand next to me then and then I'll, I'll look normal size. That'll be yeah. fine, they can come in my pictures. <laughs> Well, I think it's going to be, it's, but it's, it's standing up to being a wonderful festival. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be good fun. Um, yeah, so I'm, the, I'm going to be there every day. So if anyone's watching is coming on any day, come and say hi to me. So I'll be at J64 at System in Tarka. Um, and I'm also doing a talk about Stash Hub on Sunday as well. Um, so that's going to be at 12.30 on Sunday if anyone's about then. Um, but yeah, anyway, have a great show judy and everyone else that's going. Well. 
And yeah, I will be back next week with another Stash Chats. I'm talking to Tony R from the Sewing Bee fame next week. So it's going to be another fun episode. So I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining live and chatting with me and Judy. And if you're watching on Catch Up, say hi in the comments. Bye. Bye.